Oh. <laughs> All righty. All right, let's turn to the book of Philippians. And my wife just explained to me, I think yesterday, that I only have two more. Is this counted as one of them? And I'm just barely going, and we're not going to do a second semester. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to just read my notes instead of, because we've taken so much time in the first chapter that I'm just going to have to make sure we get through this. Um, but we're in. The prodigal spent his life in riotous living. I see you out there. I know you. Sorry, I'm slipping into my native tongue there. <laughs> All right, Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to just read from verse 5. Well, let's, let's do 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And, um, all right, I'm, I'm reading. What is set forth in verse 6 through 8 now gives validity to the actions of verses 3 through 4 because they are now seen to be based upon Christ crucified, meaning that he's calling for a humility and a, a servant attitude, uh, a self-giving and doing things in lowliness of mind. And now verse 6 through 8 is giving validity to verse 3 and 4 because it is basically in verse 6 through 8 saying that this is just not moral and ethical teaching of Christianity this is the mind of Christ. This is, this is the actions of one who has the mind of Christ. And that mind is not just Jesus walking the shores of Galilee and healing and blessing people. It is specifically related to his mind as what took him to the cross. Okay, that's, I think that's important because it's not leaning off in other directions of Christ. It is specifically Christ and him crucified. And that's the context in which the scriptures are basing themselves. And that's the mind, what, what, what we call the mind of Christ, having the mind of Christ. Paul calls having the mind of Christ crucified. You, you, can you see that? It's more than just some general mind of being good like Jesus um, I thought about the scripture that says, and Jesus went about doing good. Well, for us, that would mean, okay, we'll go help out the, at the homeless shelter and, and go to the food bank and pass out food. And, you know, no, no, good in, in the mind of God, good is serving others, is being a blessing, is, is, is being humble and, and um, uh, instead of trying to become something great, becoming something lower so that you can help others become great and stuff like that. <clears throat> I, I, was, I, know, I was thinking about that, that TV show, um, what, uh, um, what is that? Never mind. I'll, I'll think of it here in a minute and I'll make, make a comment. Um, uh, how the mind of Christ is directly related to the cross. How the mind of Christ is directly related to self-giving as comprehended by the cross, not 
no mention in the New Testament uh, after the Gospels, no mention of Jesus giving food to the poor. Did he? Yes. But that is not the mind that Paul is calling for. That is not the mind that the New Testament scriptures after the resurrection calls for. It calls for us to be his body. It calls for us to have his mind. And his mind in this case is specifically let this mind be in you. Let the, this attitude be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, in how he approached the cross and how he approached um, his death instead of how he approached um, good deeds. Um, oh yeah, that, the name of that show is America's Got Idols, and uh, they have all these talented people on there. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, and how people are pressing themselves forward to become something great and everything when Jesus says the greatest among you will be servant of all. And having that heart, not not being that way naturally. If, even if you are that way naturally, that's not having the mind of Christ. The literal mind of Christ is Christ crucified mind, not just being a humble person. You know, some people are more demonstrative in their demeanor. Other, other people are, you know, very humble looking. But trust me, just because you're humble looking doesn't mean you're a humble person, you know. In fact, I have known many a humble person that was very proud proud about it you know <laughs> and so the, what the Lord's calling for is Christ what the Lord is calling for is the mind of Christ what um, Buddhism calls for is humility we're not Buddhists we're not calling for humility we're calling for Christ's mind to be in his body and humility is produced by Christ in his in and through his body. Okay, so that's important. Um, you'll be glad to know I have read <clears throat> one sentence so far. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> all right, so um, so from verses five through eight, we have the basis of comparison with verse three and four. Verse three and four is not telling you to truly be humble; it is telling you be humble by letting this mind be in you, all right? <clears throat> that basis is outside the realm of our own resources. In other words, don't call up your own love. Don't call up your own humility. Don't call up your own selflessness. Reckon yourself dead and only alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That's what it says in Romans, okay? Uh, the fountainhead and springs from which they, are, they flow are the very attitudes and mindset of Jesus' Jesus's approach concerning the cross. Notice that the reference to the cross here has nothing to do with atonement, but with Christian experience. And that's important. Yes, we believe in the atonement. Thank God. Thank God for the atonement. But these scriptures are mentioning the cross without talking about your personal salvation without talking about anything about your sins or this or that with primarily talking about this cross was not just a means of saving you it was an example of the Christian life that could only take place after the resurrection when we became one with him in becoming his body and in resurrection so Bless you. Um, we tend to see the cross as an act of salvation without seeing the self-abasement that took place. We also do not see it as the attitude that is supposed to become the common way of relating among those who have joined to Christ. Well, you know, all, we're just happy we got saved. You know, we're just happy we're not going to burn in hell forever. But, but, we're, but many Christians... And just hear me out. Many Christians that are happy that they're not going to spend uh, eternity in the flames of hell are very selfish or hard to get along with or demanding. Can I get an amen? I mean, that, yet, and yet they're saved, and yet true salvation, folks, is not just a ticket that he gave you. True salvation is to be saved from yourself by the cross, saved from the devil, by the cross, saved from your sins, by the cross, saved from the flesh, by the cross, 
Every one of those are saved from the world by the cross. Every one of those are listed in the scriptures, and the cross is the means uh, by which that uh, takes place. Um, all right, so let me, we, I want to make some comparisons like we did last week when we wrote um, these things on the board. No, I just needed to come out in the name of Jesus. All right. Um, verses 3 through 4. Do nothing. Okay? Do nothing. Uh, from, and I'll just put self. Okay. Do nothing, and, and basically, again, we're just quoting... Uh, Verse 3 and 4 here. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Do nothing from a selfish perspective. Okay? Compared with verse uh, 6 through 8. And now I'm not going to write all of this out. Um, but uh, verse 3 through 4, do nothing, he tells them, basically from a selfish motive. Verse 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus, did not reg regard equality with God. And uh, in the uh, New Revised Standard Version, uh, I'll be referring to this as the Lord leads because our time is getting away from us, uh, this translation but it says, uh, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who thought, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. The flesh exploits every opening it can. The flesh calls that a, 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 a I started to say a contact, networking, you know. You know, networking. It's the American way, you know. It's, it's why we're going to hell in a FedEx box. <laughs> yeah. American Express, yeah. <clears throat> because Christ is not being formed in the church, therefore it's only the body of Christ in name. You understand? You know, I uh, I saw a sign the other day. It says, uh, "Trust in Jesus." But the way I was standing, the f the first letter was blocked out just a little bit, and it says, "Rust in Jesus." <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, that's a, a lot of people are saying, but they are just rusting away because they're 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 not doing anything by Christ. Even if they're doing stuff on their own, they're rusting in Jesus. Because they're not trusting in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus, how, oh, we know you're up there. No, trusting in his love when we have no love. Not just saying, I don't have love, oh God, give me love. He gave you all the fruit of the Spirit when he gave you Jesus, when he gave you the Holy Spirit. That, that isn't going to come from above. It's going to come within. Amen. Amen? It comes from within. <clears throat> all right. Uh, in verse 3 through 4, Uh, another contrast, uh, in humility regard others. I'll just write in humility because my chalk is going the way of all flesh. It's big enough. It's just, I got it. All right. In humility, how did I say it? In humility regard others, but verse 6. He humbled himself. Okay? All right. So verse 3 through 4 is telling you the action. But verse 5 through 8 is giving you the ability. Verse 3 through 4, if it doesn't 
reveal Christ in you, if it doesn't reveal the cross, all it is is commands given whether to a Buddhist or Hindus or whatever. It's telling you to do something. Well, what's the difference? But what is the difference between any religion then? If, if everybody's going to be humble and everybody's going to be good and unselfish and all this stuff, what's the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is. Our religion, our belief system is the only one where the great teacher, the great one who taught us these things, comes inside and can live it. That's the difference. That's a pretty big difference. Because everybody else just tells you what to do. But let, he's, he's not forcing it on you. Let is not a force, forcing word. It's a yielding word. Let this mind, this crucified mind, this crucified life by means of this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Don't just let him die for you and you get the benefits from it. Let the same mind that died for you work in you for others. In humility regard others. He humbled himself. See, do you see the source is Christ and him crucified. It's not just a, it's not just a command. It's not just a teaching. <clears throat> okay. Um, humbled himself and died for others. And then I put uh, not, not self, but others. There's another way of saying that. Yes. Galatians 2.20. Not I, but Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. For you Spanish speakers, con Cristo estoy juntamente crucificado. Y ya no vi, yo vivo yo. Cristo vive in me. Yes. A little louder. I did a comparative study of religions for myself one time, and just, just a long time ago, I would see the difference in My basic conclusion was that every leader of every major religion, other than Christianity, got to what they believe and what they teach basically out of, out of a self serving quest. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now look at this. This is actually in two sections. Earthquake. Uh, verse 3 and through 4 compared to verse 6 and 8, do nothing. Verse 3 and 4 with 6 and 8, do humble yourself. What is that talking about? Yes. Reject me as the source and I'm going to yield to the spirit of the Lamb to go down for others. Okay. What is this referring to from our last class? The coin. The coin. The coin. The coin. Remember, the coin has two sides, a heads and a tails, a positive and a negative. And I, I, I think that you think you understand this concept and that it's common ground to you. The pattern of this is exactly this. It is specifically this. It is always a do nothing, did not. This is what he didn't do, the tail side. And here is the head side. But humbled himself in humility. You let this mind be in you so that you'll be humble. It is this two-sided coin. Uh, I had a, a, Josiah came up to me afterwards and said, he said, yeah, I've seen that pattern in Proverbs. You know. The only difference in Proverbs and in the New Testament is, number one, in the New Testament, it's always Christ. And of course, in Proverbs, it really is a reference all to Christ. He's the righteous. You're not righteous. He is your righteousness. So let Christ live in you. But anyway, there it is saying the bad guys do this or, or don't do this, you know, like the bad guys, but do this. Well, all of that is Christ. He doesn't do that because he does this. That's his nature. That's God. That's why Peter tells us that we have become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers so that his life, his spirit, his nature can fulfill, not 
Keep the law, fulfill it. Bless you. Amen. So I got Jesus right here blessing you. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let's talk about this uh, this exploiting thing. Um, Although high above all other beings ever to exist with no one to put limits on his freedom, Jesus chose to humble himself and not to exalt himself above mankind, but become one of them. But by becoming a slave, he made himself lower than the average man and went lower still to be the highest being in the universe that was yet crucified by the lowest form of men. Paul takes note of such actions and wants to embody that selfless giving and make it the pattern for his life and that of other Christians also. Meaning, Paul didn't just see Jesus hanging on two pieces of wood. He saw Jesus going to the cross in a certain spirit and in a certain way, and he recognized that from the Holy Spirit to be the very pattern, the very pinnacle of the explanation of God and of the Christian life, how God wants us to live, by Christ. Therefore, this way. So do you see that? He, so he's, he's not just seeing Jesus die for sins, and we go, okay, and then he died, and we go, praise God, the, the lamb died so that I don't go to hell. He's seeing a completely different spirit at work in Jesus compared to us. For example, where are the disciples? Do they believe what Jesus said? Yes, don't they? They followed him for three and a half years. They believe everything that he said. But when it came time to go to the cross, they all scattered. Do you see the contrast? And so he's seeing the most committed, the ones who have left all, the most, you know, I mean, we, we look around and we find the most committed people and we think, oh my God, if I could just be like them, you are like them. Under the gun, under the right circumstance that requires the cross, they'll run too. Jesus won't. And Jesus at that time was outside of them. And so they run off and he goes to the cross. Jesus now, after the resurrection, is inside of us. Our hope, our hope is Christ in us. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Cristo en ti, la esperanza de glory. That's our hope. Our hope is not Jesus coming back in the sky. It doesn't say our hope is Jesus coming. It says our hope is Christ in you, not Christ with you, not Christ in your church service, not Christ walking along beside you. That. You know, he did that and got the T-shirt. I don't think he wears it, <laughs> but he walked along beside us. He was there, and we still messed up. He taught us for three, you understand when I say us, that a humankind, us. If we had been there, we go, if I'd been there, I wouldn't have ran off. <laughs> oh, you scaredy cat. You lily-livered chicken. Anyway. You would have too. You know. Christ won't. And so God looks around and goes, everybody fails me. The angels fail me. The men, you know, when Adam and Eve, everybody fails me. But my son that's here at my right hand, will you go down there and not just die for him and then leave him the same way they are, selfish and and, and uh, petty and, you know, can't get along over anything. Live in them and let your light shine in them and you be the being of the body of Christ. You be the life of the body of Christ. Well, so what do we do? We, we set up a religion called Christianity and we leave Christ out of it and we call ourselves the body of Christ with no thought of Christ being the life. We live for God. I'm going to live for you. How's that working for you? We'll go take a poll in most churches. It's not working. It's not working because 
God's answer was Christ, and we've left him out of the equation. No, we're, no, you know, we haven't totally left him out of the equa equation. We put him back where he was in the old covenant, back up in heaven far away. Help me. That's what the Jews pray. pray. Help me. Make me more loving. Give me, you know, this and that. Old covenant, old covenant relationship. Christ has come. Guess what? He's here. He's right here. He's watching you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Drink time. So I, I, I read, Paul takes note of such actions and wants to embody. He didn't say, I want to copy. Yeah. Paul's the one who came up, received the revelation that we could be the body instead of the copy machine. We are God's copy machine. We make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy until you can't see what, it is, what the image is anymore. You know? We're not the copy machine of God. We are the body of Christ. And Paul saw it and he said, I want to embody Christ. Not just talk about him, not just preach him, not just teach the ethics, the ethical teachings of Jesus Christ. The ethical teachings of Jesus Christ will destroy you if you do not conform to the image of Christ. Well, maybe you don't understand that. You're, you're too young. Just get more committed, get as committed as you can, and try to do everything God wants you to do without Christ being your life. And pretty soon you'll either kill me or yourself. <laughs> All right. Um, so Paul takes note of such actions and wants to embody that selfless giving and make it the pattern for his life, doesn't he? He wants to make it, but more than that, he doesn't just want to make it the path, and that of other Christians also, and that's why he's writing this. He sees Christ crucified as what we follow because this is who we embody. Christ crucified is what we follow because this is who we embody. This is the mind that has been imparted to us. The mind of Christ is not the brain of God. The, uh, if, if, and I'm making a contrast because uh, consider uh, the brain of God being that he is omnipotent, which means what? All, I'm sorry, I, should, I meant uh, omniscient, bless you. Omniscient. Anyway, all-knowing. Uh, so what do we do? We try to, cr we go to Bible school, we go to church, we go to Sunday school, and we try to cram all of this God stuff into our brain, and our brain's like this, and God's like, you know, and, you know, and we're trying to cram it in there, and secretly, though we don't really understand it, we're trying to become omniscient so that we will know what to do in every circumstance. That's what we're trying to do, most Christians, maybe, maybe not you. You haven't got that far yet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but this, this is not the plan of God that we have the brain of God, but the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is specifically in Philippians declared to be, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, that's not a period at the end of that, who being in the form of God thought it not, you know, something to be exploited for his own benefit. Selfless God. Selfless Jesus. And we see it on the cross. We go, oh, oh, he's so beautiful. How would you die for me? And why would you die for me? You know, you love me so much. No, he died not just for you, but with you. I am crucified with Christ because you're not, he loved you so much that because you're such a mess. And I am, and we all are, so that Christ may fill our vessels. 
But we have this treasure, and it's Christ, in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power of carrying out the Christian life may be of God and not of us. That's why he said, I put Christ in there. And until you recognize, until you recognize the value of Christ in you, but when you recognize the value of his life as opposed to yours, he'll be, he'll be called treasure. But now you don't call him treasure, you know, unless you just get real ooey gooey, you know. Oh, you're my treasure, you know. Most of the time, oh, he's Lord, he's, you know, all this you know, things like that. You, won't, you don't treasure him yet the way God wants you to treasure him. Um, he sees Christ crucified as what we follow because this is who we embody. There is no other concept called the Christian life apart from God's definition and, and apart from the, what the word of God says. Okay? <clears throat> Jesus became a servant, a slave. He enslaved himself, and that's very important. And I mean, it's incredibly important because I don't think we get that. He enslaved himself. How do we comprehend the concept of self-enslavement? The King James Bible translates the word slave as servant, or at least many of our Bibles do. This translation forfeits much of the meaning behind what Jesus did. His actions should be the standard and definition for the meaning of this Greek word. Jesus self-enslaved himself. He did that. He chose that. He chose that only for others. It would, it would not benefit him in the least. In fact, it would turn to his own crucifixion. It would turn to God being accused, the Son of God being accused of stuff that was not even possible for his being to do. It would turn into incredible physical beating. Uh, it would turn to all of this. He literally enslaved himself, put himself put himself under self-enslavement for others. So we read, and he became a servant. He's in the form of God, and he became a servant. And go. So we see him walking around in a little butler outfit, carrying a little tray and going, would you like a, you know, a kipper? Would you like a, what is a kipper? I do not know. It's a fish stick. Would you like a fish stick? <laughs> It sounds better calling him a kid. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, that is sort of the picture we have. Sort of not, you know, well, not really a slave, you know, like, you know, you know, it's more a picture of like a butler going, oh, well, let me serve you, you know. And of course, if you're polite and well-mannered back, I'll give you even better service, right? Isn't that sort of this, the Christian concept of being a servant? I will serve you, and if, you, and if you're kind and, you know, gentle with me, I'll, I will serve you the more, you know? Well, how about you let me slap you and strike you and beat you and hang you on a cross? Well, that ain't being a servant. That, you know. Well, the reason why you're hung on a cross is because the butler did it. <laughs> <clears throat> and you are that butler. <clears throat> All right, so um, Jesus, uh, let's see. I think I read that. Ah, keep your place here, but let's turn quickly to Romans 15. I'm trying to turn quickly, but my pages are messing with me. Romans 15 uh, and verse uh, <clears throat> 3, I think it is here, I hope it is. Oh, I'm, I'm reading it and I'm going, that is not the scripture I want. That is the enigma of turning to 1 Corinthians 15. Romans 15, 
verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. All right. I've shared this before in other classes, but I mean, this scripture is pretty evident what it says. For even Christ pleased not himself, uh, but it, as it is written, the, the reproaches of them who reproached thee fell on me. So we read this and we go, okay, even Christ pleased not himself. So I really would like to get a really nice pair of boots. I know you think I'm talking to you girls. But I'm not. You know, uh, it's not that I need another pair of boots. But I would really like another pair just because I'd really like another pair. Okay? So, then you read this scripture and you go, oh, Yes, Lord. <laughs> I'm not going to please myself and get those boots. I'm going to live for God. And then, of course, you see another Christian walking around with those boots on. You go, what? That ain't right. <laughs> but that's another story. <clears throat> Folks, this isn't talking about giving up your boots or your iPod or any of that stuff. This is talking about, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproach, he's talking about, this is, this is how he didn't please himself. The, the very accusations that should go on them, they put on him. See, we talked about this before, the scapegoat in the Old Testament, you know, and the priest comes and he lays his hands on the scapegoat and he confesses the sins over over the goat and sends him off in the wilderness and then the priest you know, takes the blood of the other one and he puts it on the altar and on the, the um, um, Ark of the Covenant and comes out of the Holy of Holies and comes out to the people and everyone rejoices because a new year has begun. The Day of Atonement is over and we're all clean. And so we say, oh, it's such a beautiful picture, folks. The true picture of that, that's just a shadow. The true picture of that is when the high priest and all of the Pharisees and all of the leadership blamed Jesus and said, you're the one who's doing this. You have a demon. You're trying to lift up yourself. You're saying you're something that you're not. Accusing him enough to say, see, the accusations are big enough for you to die and they're laying their sins on him, and he's standing there and taking it for them so that he can bear their sins. But if one person comes up and says something false about you, or you hear it and it gets bad, did you know that, did you know that Brother So-and-so said that, you know, you're the one who, you know, you took some money out of the offering plate. I did not. know what you do and you know I've seen it too <laughs> no not pleasing yourself as described by God is related to Christ crucified because what does it say right here he pleased not himself but the reproach that's at the cross folks Every reference takes you to the cross. It doesn't tell you to have Christian ethics. It doesn't tell you to be Christ-like. It takes you to the cross, and it says you died at the cross. Christ is your life. You are the body of Christ. Embody Christ and let Christ be seen. Let him express himself through you instead of staying up in heaven and you praying to him and asking for help. And specifically, he is quoting this because he's saying, the area that I would be pleased with you not pleasing yourself wouldn't be so much in terms of the boots. And I hear a collective, oh, praise God. I can get that. Thank God for Brother Randy who preaches the truth. <laughs> I can have my boots. 
<laughs> yeah, but you can also have other people saying junk about you and tearing you down and going to other people and talking and telling all that and spreading it and going as far as they can until your name is mud and God tells you to be like Christ crucified and open not your mouth. Are you going to do it? And not only not open your mouth, because some of you have gotten pretty good at biting your tongue not open in your mouth. There is a difference. Not opening your mouth by Jesus is, you know, I am not going to justify myself. God will. And I am not going to try to get out of this situation. But for this cause came I to this situation. Right? That I might be a ransom for many. All right. So, um, I didn't read this, but I did read it. Let's, let's read verse 5 and 6 with that. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ, that you, may be with one, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so it says, now the God of patience and, con and consolation grant you to be like-minded, meaning... The God who is this way grant you to have this same mind because that's what he's basically talking about. Um, in uh, Romans 15, 3, 5 through 6, there it says that he did not please himself. It means he did not use his advantages as God to do what pleased him, but humble himself for the benefits of others. It goes on to say that we who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. You know? We who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Um, all right. Well, immediately our mind goes to we who are strong. The definition of that, not in the context of the Bible, because we don't read the context. We just, we just apply it to whatever, you know, some religious teaching that we have. It's not talking about we who are super spiritual. It's not talking about the spiritual ones in the church or the spiritual ones in the Bible school. Because for us, the spiritual ones are the ones who can, who lead and they can stand up and they can exhort or they can share Jesus in a special way and they can go through trials and they don't completely fall apart like you and I. So they're the strong ones. We go, you that are strong, see, we want to be strong, but since you are, you ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. It's not, it's not talking about that kind of strength. It's talking about the strength to be able to take the reproaches that they would get. They're the weak ones. Let's see, I, I think I had it something, maybe. Ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. It is referring to we who are strong in a life that lives for others. That's the strong. That's the one. Yes. So look at the outward standards. And so they, that, those people, people who need those standards, out, are the first ones to put place reproach on Christ. Amen. You know, that's, so I see that time in there too. Amen. Well, I didn't want to go and teach your book since I know that that's where you're teaching. Okay. Romans 1 then. <laughs> All right. So we are strong in a life that lives for others. Not living a selfish, self-pleasing life is defined in these verses by Jesus and his handling of things in his life. It is that of letting the insults of the weak fall on us, etc. This is also Paul's definition of the word strong. His view of strength is on a completely different basis than that of the world in much of Christianity. And I, I said that and then I realized basically I'm talking about um, 1 Corinthians one, two, three, uh, probably all the way up to four. But since we don't have time to do Philippians, I, don't, I shouldn't teach Romans and Corinthians right now. All right, so uh, back in uh, Philippians, 
um, in Philippians 2, 6, we discover that even in being God, he did not see equality with God as something to be exploited. Well, how many of us would have? How many of us, if you come from a privileged home or you're, you know, this or that, or, uh, you know, my dad's the pastor or not, you know, but, you know, I got some, I have some advantage here. And so this is, I can use this to, ex, to exploit it to my own benefit. Um, he didn't see equality with God as something to be exploited. Wow. I mean, that's just, just incredibly powerful if we would comprehend that. He didn't? No, that's what this is talking about. He didn't. He didn't see that as some, and, and yet he could have, and he even understood how, and he had the ability to step into that place if he wanted to, and he said he did. I could call 10,000 angels, but he didn't do it because that would be the ability of God or equality with God to be able to call 10,000 angels to circumvent this bad situation. But for Jesus, it wasn't a bad situation. It was an opportunity to manifest the nature of God. It was an opportunity to give himself for others. But when we get in a similar situation, we simply see it as a bad situation. Oh, I had a good situation last week, you know, when everybody loved me and was kind to me and said good things, and now I'm in a bad situation. No, it's not a bad situation. This is the opportunity to live Christ, to let Christ come out. I told Deb the other day, I said, I love you more today than yesterday because I was pretty hacked off at you yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes he was God but he is constitutionally built in such a way that it is not his tendency to exploit advantage he is built in a way that he is not constitutionally built to exploit advantage folks most people are looking for the advantage they're constantly looking for the advantage. They want to be up on other people, and they're looking for the advantage. Jesus was in the form of God, but he emptied himself. Here's the choice between what could have been accomplished based on advantage as opposed to what Jesus actually chose. Now, now come on. The plan of God, the eternal plan of God. Two different ways of approaching this situation. Jesus standing there before the angels, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, before he comes down and is incarnated and says, I can go down there and with the backing of the angels and power to do miracles or to, you know, stop the, you know, just like he could calm the seas, he could also make them, you know, do that. And with all of the powers of God, I can convince these people that I'm God and they will bow down and go, oh my God, it's God. I can exploit my advantage as God to convince them and to bring about victory over the devil. Instead, he says, I think I'm just going to die on a cross for others. Why would you do that? Because it's not in my constitution to exploit advantage. It is in my, con and this is Jesus speaking, it's in my constitution to lift up others, to humble myself, to do nothing from so, to, to not regard my equality with God as something to exploit. But it is more akin to who we are, Father, that instead of convincing them I'm God by power, convincing them of what God is like by selfless giving, sacrifice of my own self instead of them, but that deserve it. It's, it's a powerful concept to realize that he didn't choose 
to exploit his advantages. Um, he took a lower seat instead of rising up and taking the highest rightful seat. Because, the, let's face it, Jesus doesn't need to take the lower seat. He sh he's, he's got every right to take the higher seat, doesn't he? Okay, there is a difference between right and constitution. Your constitution being your true inward makeup. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus had the right to call 10,000 angels. He didn't do it. He had the right to take the upper seat. He didn't do it. He got so low, and that's what this is talking about, and, you know, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, being fine and fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. There we see a picture of what God exalts. There we see that had Jesus just exploited uh, the advantages that he has of God, it, was, it wouldn't have expressed God. It wouldn't have honored God. God would not have honored him. Exalt yourself and God will bring you down. Humble yourself and God will bring you up because he honors that selfless giving that comes only by Christ and can only come through us in a true purity of form by the life and nature of Christ in us. It's the only way. It's the only way possible. You know, instead of just trying to be a good Christian, Try to be a dead Christian. I am crucified with Christ. Christ liveth in me. You know. All right. Um, and I and I see the lower seat, not as we see it. Walk into a room, lots of seats, the the preeminent seats. And Jesus talked about the Pharisees being this way. You you love to take the upper seats in the. You know what I mean. So. You know, and then the lower ones down here, uh, Jesus, we, we see him walk into a room and go, okay, I'm not going to, even though I, rightfully I should be able to sit up there, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take the lower seat. We see all this false humility and junk. It's his nature to want to lift others up. It is, he, he does not... Um, I just love this. Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. This isn't some humbling thing that he has to work his way through and then do it. This is who he is. He esteems others better than himself. Does he know that he's better? Yes. That's the thing that makes it so beautiful, that he does know I'm the son of God. But he's not, and he didn't take the seat at the right hand of God. Not in this case. In this case, because, wherefore, because the lower you got, I have highly exalted him above. God the Father did that. See? Now, if you don't trust God, you'll never humble yourself because, well, if I, what's the old saying? If I don't take care of myself, who will? You know, it's like after, you know, the fires down in Texas and Austin, that area, after that took place, they had one of the guys and they said, you know, well, you seem to be kind of doing okay. Why is that? He says, what can I do? He says, what can I do? I can't do anything. All I can do is pray. All I can do is pray. What do you mean all you can do? My God, you can talk to your father. You can release the spirit of Christ to your father. And your father will respond to Christ yes. in you, out of you, yes. because he loves his son. That's why he calls him his beloved son. He never calls you the beloved son. He says you're accepted in the beloved. He doesn't say, he doesn't say you're accepted. He says you're accepted in as a member of his body because that's Jesus in his body, and you have become his body. Amen. See? And so, um, you know, all I can do is pray, or, you know, we, we talk about these things as, as they really are religious things that we're going through because we haven't let that mind be in us. Listen carefully. When you let the mind of Christ be in you, those things you don't have to calculate your way through. 
You don't have to go get you know, on this computer. Well, should I? Da, 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 okay, I'll take the next lowest seat. And da, 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 because if I take the lowest seat, then they'll really think I'm a low life. You know what I mean? I mean, go. You can. Your mind can just. Yeah, I will do this. I will obey. Doctor Who? Uh, All right. Although Jesus has the advantage, the status, he does not go that route. He goes the way of the cross. Prestige, power, prosperity, position, all peace. I just thought it was interesting. Oh, there's a sentence here. I'm sorry. Prestige, power, prosperity, position are all normally sought by men, not for how they can be used for the advantage of others, but for personal advantage. Isn't that right? You seek power. You seek prosperity. You seek prestige. And all for your own advantage, especially that last one. To prestige. To pursue such things is to be motivated contrary to the cross of Christ. Paul also notes that the Philippians should not work on the basis of vainglory and self-interest, but again, for others. Take a break. We'll come back in about five, ten minutes.